Welcome back to the channel. My name is Lisa Evans Del Torre and I'm a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Over the last year and a half or so, I've been featuring each Vigil Hawa or King's Daughter and getting to know their stories a little bit better. There are over 700 of them. We're doing number 178 today, so we've gone. We've come a long way, got a long way to go. But before we begin, let me show you ways you can help the channel. The first three keep you in the know. Subscribe, like, which helps that logarithm thing, and then notify so that you know um, you get a notification every time I post new content. And then um, there are a couple of other ways to help the channel grow on a more exponential on a, on a financial note. We have thanks, which can be found on your the super thanks, which can be found on your YouTube um, panel. And then we have coffee, which is another on another platform and then Patreon as well. So all of those are ways of helping the channel grow and prosper. So with that being said, let's get to know number 178. So here we come to episode 178, and Talbu, which I believe is how you pronounce it. It could, in English we would say Talbot, but Talbu is I assume the French pronunciation. This was a request from you. I do not have her in my file. So again, thank you to my viewer who reached out and suggested this. Um, particular Fejoa. So Anne was born in 1651 in the town of Rouen. Uh, the, we'll get to know her parish very, uh, very soon. But it was Saint Maclou. Her parents were Eustache Talbot and Marie de la Londe. Now she was born in Normandy, where you can see in the upper uh, left. Uh, circle of France, and then inside Normandy, she's part of the Seine Maritime Département, and inside, so I've circled that, and inside that, Rouen is a very big city, so I wanted to show um, where it was situated. Now, she, Rouen is a city on the River Seine in northern France. It's the capital of the region of Normandy. Rouen has such an amazing historical um, story, and as it, and was at one time the largest city in medieval uh, Europe. It played a prominent role in both English and French histories from about the 11th to the 15th century. Joan of Arc was tried and burned alive in 1431 in this area. The picture that you see right here in the middle is part of that complex where they, they honor that particular spot that Joan of Arc died in. Um, and um, Rouen is a city of cultural and educational significance. It was from this area that the Statue of Liberty sailed in June of 1885. Now, um, this cathedral, St. Maclou, is one that um, began sometime in 1432. We've actually seen this uh, church before, uh, way back in episode 12 with Elisabeth Cretel. So it's, it's kind of neat that we're starting to see, um, you know, at some point, we're going to repeat. And of course, I wanted to show you a picture of the downtown core. The middle uh, picture not only shows you the um, Joan of Arc Memorial, but it also shows you what it looks like. It's truly a Normandy town. And then, of course, on the bottom left is the River Seine and how it encompasses the town. Upon the death of her father, um, Anne would leave for New France. Um, she arrived on La Nouvelle France on July 30th, 1670. She carried with her a dowry worth about 300 pounds. Now let's see who's the groom that she selected and who selected her. So the groom that she would eventually select, his name, Jean Garou de Saint-Onge, and he was born in 1646 in La Rochelle, France. His parents were Dominique Garou and Marie Pinard. La Rochelle is another large center. So we have Anne, who's born at, um, at Rouen, a very large city, and now he's born at La Rochelle. I rarely see this combination of the big, two big city people kind of merging in New France. So that's kind of interesting to think about. La Rochelle was founded during the 10th century and became an important harbor in the 12th. Until the 15th century, La Rochelle was to be the largest French harbor on the Atlantic coast, dealing mainly in the good stuff, wine, salt, and cheese. The name uh, was first recorded as Rupella in 961, if you can believe that. Uh, and it meant, it was in Latin uh, meaning um, little rock. 
La Rochelle has one of the richest histories of all the towns of France from its beginnings as an area where the Knights of Templar had their strongest base. Eleanor married Henry Plantagen in 1152, who would become King of England just two years later as Henry II, thus putting La Rochelle under Plantagenet, or British or English rule, until Louis VIII captured it in the 1224 siege of La Rochelle. During the Plantagenet control of the city, uh, in 1185, Henry II had the Vauclair Castle built, remains of which are still visible in the Place de Verdun. From 1568 on, La Rochelle would become a center for Huguenots. It was in La Rochelle that the Protestant revolt occurred and created the uprising that would become known as the Siege of La Rochelle. Throughout the 1660s, the Huguenots were expelled from this area. Now, we always, whenever anybody is from La Rochelle, uh, we say, were they Protestants? Well, we don't know for sure. The church that he probably was baptized in was St. Marguerite, which actually was used by um, Protestant people from the Protestant faith and the Catholic faith at one time. Um, it is, here's what I know. I know that if you're from this area, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, you would have experienced that kind of intense um, fighting and um, absolute uprisings and would have been influenced. Your life would have been influenced by the fact that you did not, you know, you either did not want to participate or you were participating. So that is part of the history of what Ja brings when he leaves for New France. So we do not know precisely when Jean arrives in New France, but we can assume that by 1670, he is free to marry and has the resources necessary to attract a bride of the Fille du Roi um, stature. So let's get to see when and where they got married. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to the church. Um, first, um, she would have, Anne would have one uh, marriage um, proposal that she eventually would cancel with a man named Jean Berlou. Um, that was in September. And then um, our own Jean would actually have two uh, canceled marriage contracts, one with a fellow fille du roi, uh, Marie Navon, Navon um, in September. And at the end of September, he would try again, and it was also canceled, Marie Madeleine Deschamps. So here we have like all of these fits and starts, and then finally, November 2nd, 1670, they are married at Boucherville, and um, they she is given the king's gift as well of the 50 pounds. So finally, our couple um, can settle down. So the family would settle at Boucherville. Boucherville was founded as a seigneurial parish in 1667 by none other than Pierre Boucher, uh, for whom the city was later named. Pierre Boucher originally came from Normandy and having lived in Quebec City in Trois-Rivières and becoming the governor um, of Trois-Rivières, Boucher moved to this area uh, where he then founded the, the town. The first Catholic church of the village of Boucherville was built in 1670 and then this church was replaced in 1712 and then ultimately replaced in 1801 by the building you see before you, the Church of Saint Famille. Several families left Bougelville in the 18th centuries to found the communities of Saint Julie and Saint Bruno. And you can see Bougelville on the map. Uh, it looks very far away from Montreal. It is, and it's kind of halfway between um, where I, you know, come from um, and Drummondville. And so, but it's on the other side. So, um, and so I would see it all the time. That, and we would go to Bougelville. This was a, a very common place to go to. This I love this particular picture of Bougelville taken from the waters uh, where you can see the church and how pretty the, the town really is. And we see here uh, next to the statue of Mr. Bouchy, we see um, the 1681 census, which has Jean and his children, Marie, Pierre, and Madeleine, they have four goats and nine arpavala, about seven acres of land. So Anne and, and Jean would have a total of 15 children. Let's have a look at that family. Marie would marry Jean-Baptiste Lemoureux and have nine children. 
all of him would make it. His mother was Françoise Bourbet, who we featured in episode 112. Pierre would marry Marie-Marguerite Marie Guidé and had four children, three of whom would make it. He then married Marie-Anne Moget and had two children, both of whom made it. Madeleine married Jacques Guerby and had three children, two of whom made it. Prudent would die in infancy. Jean married Thérèse Lebeau and had three children, all of whom would make it. Her mother was Etienne Loret, who we featured in episode 92. Jacques did die in infancy. Dominique would marry Geneviève Donnet and have seven children, all of whom would make it. Geneviève's mom was Marie-Richard Richard, who we featured in episode 119. François would marry Marguerite martin but did not have any children. Claire Françoise would die at 15. Anne would marry Jean-Joseph Huet and have five children, all of whom would make it. Marguerite would marry Jean-Martin Martin Beau and have six children, all of whom would make it. Marie-Louise married Jean Donon and had six children, all of whom would make it. Suzanne would marry Pierre Delby and would have 12 children, nine of whom would make it. Geneviève would marry Nicolas Vincent and had four children, all of whom would make it. Just a tremendous, tremendous family growth. Jean would pass away on the 6th of June, 1713. He was 67 years old. Um, they had been married 43 years, just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, um, thing. But the story gets a little interesting. It's not just an ordinary death. It appears that um, it was presumed that he had killed himself, which in the Catholic Church obviously is a sin, and you cannot be buried in a cemetery on holy ground. And the parish priest refused to bury her husband of 43 years. Anne Thelmo, um asked to have her husband exhumed from where he was first buried and have him reburied on holy ground. Um, after investigation of his life and his religion, the order was given for him to be buried within the cemetery. So it was absolutely, absolutely a win for her. And how brave was she? Um, and, and we, you know, it is entirely possible he had killed himself, but it, there were extenuating circumstances. Um, and uh, it is said that he was of unsound mind following an extended fast. Possibly he was sick, we don't know. Uh, but obviously, once they looked at his life, they knew that it wasn't a suicide. It was probably an end of life request, that sort of thing. Perhaps he was in a lot of pain, but whatever. Anne wanted her husband to be buried in a holy ground. And that is an amazing thing for a woman of her time to have done and fight the authorities and fight the religion, no, no less would eventually pass away in 1740 at the astonishing age of 89, although the burial record indicates 95. We can, you know, back then, that was really old. <laughs> so, who knows? Um, but certainly she exceeded the lifespan of an average woman of her time. She, as of 1729, and she was living when they did this study, um, would have 133 descendants, of which my viewer is one of them. I'm anxious to find out who is the, who are the descendants of this amazing couple. I think that they are truly um, a study in perseverance and um, longevity for sure. Um, so let me know, okay? Here are some of my top resources that I use. La Société des Filles du Roi, the Quebec Genealogical Society, Nos Origines, Généalogie Québec, a Facebook group called Filles du Roi Descendants, and Wikitree. All of these are amazing uh, resources to get you started and deepen your, resor your research. And so we end episode 178. What a story Anne Tanbu gave us. Um, how many children she produced? 15 children. And to go to bat against the authorities, against the church, and insist that her husband be buried. These are all marks of an incredible woman. 
and um, just really, I wish I, you know, I wish she was my gra my grandmother. So my viewer, I thank you for uh, recommending this because truly she was a woman of substance. So for her contribution, for her endurance, for her um, ability to withstand, and most of all, her sacrifice for us. We bless her memory and we thank her for her gifts. Until I see you on episode 179, au revoir.